Turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis is the first book of your Bible. Chapters are the large numbers on the page and the verses are the small numbers to help us navigate. Have you ever made an absolute mess of things? You ever done that? I've done that before, right? We've all had those projects. We're like two hours in and we realize we messed up an hour and 59 minutes ago. And now we've got to go back and undo it all. Right, and we're so disheartened. Maybe, maybe it's worse though. Maybe it's not a mechanical problem or a construction problem, but maybe it's a relationship. You just made an absolute mess of that relationship. Maybe words you spoke, things you did. Maybe a parent no longer speaks to you, a child no longer speaks to you, a spouse or former spouse no, spe- no longer speaks to you, a friend no longer speaks to you. I think we're all well acquainted with our propensity to mess things up, to make a mess of things. And we have seen that here in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Following the first sin, God cursed the serpent, Satan. He punished the man and the woman. But in the midst of, you remember last week, in the midst of that declaration of judgment, God also made a promise. So they had made a complete and utter mess of things. Everything was messed up. But even in the midst of that mess, God makes a promise. And that promise was that there would be two seeds, two lines, the seed of the serpent, Satan, and the seed of the woman. And the seed of the serpent, Satan, we, uh, uh, we saw last week, would be made up of all those who would continue in that rebellion. The rebellion perpetrated by their first parents, Adam and Eve. And so those who would continue in that rebellion would be part of the seed of the serpent, Satan. Those who would reject God. Those who would choose to continue to live their own way. The seed of the woman, on the other hand, would be made up of those who would turn from their rebellion. Turn back to God. Who would obey Him and follow Him and honor Him. Both of these seeds, of course, coming from the womb of the woman, but one being in league with the devil himself and thus being spiritually his children, as it were. The fullness of the promise would be realized when, in the future, an individual born of that woman would deal a decisive blow to the serpent, Satan, by crushing his head, meaning his power and his authority, And putting an end to him. But in the meantime, enmity would continue to rule the day. There would be enmity. There would be conflict that would exist between these two seeds. Between these two lines. And what this conflict would entail could not have been fully known by the man and the woman. But in chapter 4, it is on full display. In chapter 4, our text this morning, we see the ugliness of sin laid out before us. Here we see that the sin that had promised life to the man and the woman would not merely affect them, but it would also affect all who would come after them. And it would exact a price that would crush their hearts. Look with me this morning at Genesis chapter 4 and just follow along with me this morning as I read. Beginning in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering, but for Cain in his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to his brother Cain, 
or said to Cain, where is, your Abel, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield, it yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city for the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born, born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahujael. And Mahujael fathered Methusael, and Methusael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zelah. Adah bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zelah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zelah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Chapter 4 kind of follows a, a bit of a trajectory, and I've kind of broken this down into five points that we'll work our way through this morning. First, we find a new beginning, a missed opportunity, a wicked response to harvest of evil, and it calls for hope. In verse 1, we see here that the man and the woman, now exiled from Eden, burdened by the weight of their sin and its consequences, move forward in faith and obedience to the mandate that God had given them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so what do we read? Well, we read that Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. From, from this point forward, we see what appears to be somewhat of a new beginning. Okay, a, a mess has been made of everything, but, but now we will move forward in faith and obedience and do what God has called us to do. And so Eve gives birth to two sons. She names the first son Cain, and that name Cain simply means possession or I possess. This choice of name, along with her declaration that I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord, represents an expression of hope that perhaps this child, her firstborn son, that she had now maybe perhaps come into possession of the promise made in chapter 3, that, that through her would come the serpent crusher, as it were. Of this, Martin Luther wrote, he said, For she, Eve, thought something greater concerning Cain than a natural son. She considered Cain would be that man who should bruise the serpent's head. And therefore, she does not simply say a man, but a man from Jehovah or Yahweh, implying that he would be that man concerning whom the Lord God had promised her that her seed should bruise the serpent's head. Perhaps Eve thought that the judgment that God had pronounced upon them would be short-lived. Perhaps deliverance had actually come and, and had come much sooner than expected. Eve names her second son Abel, an interesting little statement, it's just a brief uh, statement. And she gave birth to a son, Abel. And that's it. Just one simple statement. His name, name is interesting. It means breath or vapor. And the narrative would suggest that Eve here gives much less attention to Abel than she does to his brother. It would seem that a a Eve's hopes were bound up. Hopes for the future were bound up in her firstborn son, Cain. 
However, as we will see, any hopes that she may have had for salvation and deliverance through Cain were sorely misplaced. And this, friends, marks the beginning of a pattern that will unfold throughout all of Scripture and all of human history. And that is this, the propensity of human beings to place their hopes for salvation in all the wrong people. All the wrong people. And this becomes all too clear in verses 3 and following where we find a missed opportunity. We read here that Cain was a grower of crops. He was a farmer. He tilled the land. And Abel was a shepherd. And, and, and both of them have brought now an offering to the Lord. Now, we don't know much about these offerings. There, there are no instructions given up to this point for what these offerings were to be. But we can assume that God had laid out some, some expectations for what these were. We know that the true sacrifices that we're most familiar with in the Old Testament, that those will not be issued until uh, Leviticus and, uh, in that time period when you'll begin to see the blood sacrifices and the offerings that are are made uh, for sin and for guilt and so on. But these had not been instituted yet, so we don't know a whole lot. But we do know that these were likely instituted because it says here that in the course of time, they came. Well, what does it mean, the course of time? It's like saying at the appointed time, they came to offer sacrifices. So there was an expectation that God uh, had of them that they would bring sacrifices or an offering, as it were, to him. And so we can also expect that he had given them some sort of instruction as to what those offerings were to be or what they were to be like and the heart attitude into which they were to be offered up. Abel, we are told, brought an offering of, it says, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, while Cain brings what is described as the fruit of the ground. The Hebrew grammar here is interesting. So in, in, in uh, Eve's giving birth to her son, she says a lot about Cain. I have gotten a man from the Lord, right? And, and, and then Abel just says, she gave birth to a son named Abel. Well, now it's flipped. Abel is the one whose offering is described in, in glowing terms, and, C and Cain's offering is simply the fruit of the ground. So we see this contrast here, even in the grammatical structure in the Hebrew language. The, the, Abel's offering is described very purposeful. It... it, it it's not only that he brought a sheep from among the firstborn of his flock, but, but rather he brought the fattest firstborn sheep. So he, maybe he had several sheep that were the firstborn of his flock, and he picks the fattest one, the best one that he could possibly find, and he brings that one to the Lord. In other words, Abel gave the best that he could give. But the description of Cain's offering is... Quite simple, it's just the fruit of the ground. Not even the first fruits of the ground, just the fruit of the ground. The imagery here is, I had some fruit laying home in the basket, so I just brought it. Now the issue here is not that Abel bought, brought a sheep while Cain simply brought vegetables. That's been spoken before, that, oh well, Cain, the problem here is that Cain didn't bring a sheep. No, that's not the issue, that's never mentioned, it's not even addressed in the, in the correction that will follow it was not a matter of blood sacrifice versus non-blood sacrifice because blood sacrifices, as far as we know, were not yet instituted. What is at issue here is not the type of sacrifice, but the motivation of the heart behind it. Because ultimately, it is the motivation of the heart behind the offering that determines what kind of offering we bring, right? So if, if, if you are... Uh, if you have, are dating or are married and, and you have great love for your boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whatever, your feelings inside for them de generally determine the amount of money you will spend, right? And, and the, the, the type of, the, the level of thought you will put into your gift, right? If you're running out on Christmas morning, right, to Royal Farms to get your wife a Christmas gift, she's probably not going to feel very loved, right? That's evidence that maybe something's wrong in here. Now, if, if you go out, right, on like June 3rd, and you, you're buying Christmas presents for your wife, that, that shows thoughtfulness, right? You're not like most men, right, who do wait fairly close to Christmas to start shopping, right? But the point is, you, the evidence of your love for your spouse is often evidenced is often displayed in the kind of gift you bring. So, but at the end of the day, what's at, what's at root here is the, the issue of the heart and the motivation. 
The late Jewish commentator Umberto Casudo says this. He says, whereas the one worshiper went out of his way to please God, the other simply discharged a duty. Abel's sacrifice was a demonstration of love, adoration, and gratitude God, well, uh, to God, while Cain's showed a disregard, even a disdain for God. We are told here that in response to this, it says the Lord had regard for Abel's offering. He accepted his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. God accepted Abel's offering, but rejected Cain's. And this then leads to a wicked response, verse 6. Wicked response on the part of Cain. Cain's self-centered, hardened heart is clearly revealed here by his response to the Lord's rejection of his sacrifice and the corrective warning that follows. Instead of responding in humility and repentance, Cain becomes angry. He becomes angry, angry with his brother whose offering was accepted and ultimately angry with God who rejected his offering. Matthew Henry writes, he says, It is a certain sign of an unhumbled heart to quarrel with those rebukes which we have by our own sin brought upon ourselves. You want to know the true sign of repentance and humility? Is when you're corrected, you accept it. You accept it. You don't blame others. You don't get angry at others for pointing it out. That's pride. Listen to what Proverbs 19.3 says. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. How many times have we heard people angry over circumstances that we're looking at and we're like, well, what did you expect? What did you expect to get from that? Why are you angry? Why are you angry with God? God told you that that's what you would get. Cain is angry, but notice the Lord engages Cain. Verse 6, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? You could see it in his face. His anger was displayed. And again, remember, the Lord is not seeking information here, but rather he's calling Cain to examine his heart. it's, It's as though he's saying, what does your anger reveal about what you want, Cain? What is what's going on in your heart? What 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 stands at the root of this desire that you have? Examine it. Consider it. And the Lord continues, he asks another question. This one, a a call to turn from his sinful anger and simply obey. Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Hey, hey, Cain, this is not rocket science. This is not difficult. Look, the promise is right here. Do right, do the right thing, and you will be accepted. It's, It's as easy as stepping over here as opposed to stepping over there. This, I didn't make this impossible for you, Cain. This question demonstrates God's patience and grace toward him. He opens the door for Cain to do what is right, to be accepted. Come in, Cain, come, come here. But with that is a warning of danger. He says, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you but you must rule over it. Sin is described here as if it were a wild animal waiting and ready to pounce upon him. God says, look, you must master this. You must dominate this. You must overcome it. Otherwise, it will destroy you. Friends, listen, we we cannot hold a neutral position with sin. Sin must be fought and sin must be killed. That's why the Bible in the New Testament uses language about our relationship to sin as one of life and death. You either kill it and put it to death or it will kill you and everything you hold dear. It's your choice. That's the imagery that we see here. I fear that many of us do not take sin seriously. We, we dip our toes in it. We sit in front of our televisions and in our computers and we allow ourselves to be entertained by it. We laugh at it. We take it lightly. We, we play with it as if it were a harmless animal, not realizing that 
in time it will grow up to become a beast that will devour us. It reminds me of those videos of those you know, people that have those baby cub lions. And I'm thinking, that thing is cute now, but man, I would not want to be anywhere near that thing when it's full grown. It wouldn't require very much for that lion or that tiger to finish you. And that's what it's like with sin. We play with it. it oh, it's such a cute little, a, a cute little thing. It's, it's so adorable. Look at this. I can play with it, and I can manipulate it. I can get it to do what I want it to do until it's 1,500 pounds. And then it tells you what to do. One Jewish rabbi said this. He said, sin is crouching at the door. At first, it is like a passing visitor. Then, like a guest who stays longer. And finally, it becomes the master of the house. Think about the sin in your life. Bitterness and anger often begin small. They begin with moments of frustration. You lose it with the kids. You get angry with your spouse. You get frustrated with some circumstances. And, and that leads to impatience. That leads to harsh words. The raising of the voice. And in time, resentment sets in. That resentment turns to rage, destroying close relationships. And in the most extreme cases, like Cain, it leads to murder. Lustful thoughts become lustful looks, which lead to all manner of sexual sin. And then you have individuals destroyed, marriages destroyed, families destroyed. Seemingly mundane conversations about other people lead to incessant gossip as, as we start to crave and have a hunger for more and more information. And, and next thing you know, we're slandering fellow image bearers, destroying reputations, and destroying relationships. It's no wonder that James tells us and describes temptation and sin as, as that of birth. It's conceived, and then it grows, and then it gives birth. And, and when it gives birth, it's death. It's rotten. It's a corpse. There's nothing attractive there. What's, that which we once thought was beautiful now looks hideous to us. You see, friends, as we sin... Ruts or patterns are created in our hearts. Paul often speaks of practicing sin. In other words, it's a practice. It's something that becomes a pattern of your life. These ruts or patterns are created in our hearts. And, and, and over time, it becomes increasingly difficult to change them. It, it, it begins, sin begins to grow in us like a spiritual cancer until it takes over completely. You see, Cain did not just wake up one day, offer a half-hearted offering, and then killed his brother. Long before the mouth, the hands, and the feet carry out the sin, the heart has long ago been captured by it. I get the occasional letter from inmates at Sussex Correctional Institute. We used to be on the radio, broadcast radio, and they're allowed to have radios. We haven't been on the radio in a couple of years now, but... Uh, I received a letter one day from a, a gentleman, and uh, I think I read one of his letters in a sermon some years ago on pornography. And he was a married man, began to look at pornography, just somewhat entertained himself with pornography, and, and it, he said it was a kind of a casual thing, and then it grew, and it grew, and then he described for me the scene one Saturday morning in his home when the police rolled up to his driveway, broke down his door, handcuffed him, and took him to prison and he's still there for trafficking and child pornography. And he traced it all the way from those moments of just simply sitting at the computer looking at pornography like it was no big deal. Friends, that is what sin does. And if you think your sin, because it's more socially acceptable than child pornography, is somehow less dangerous, you're mistaken. You are seriously mistaken. This is why Jesus said that to look with lust is to commit adultery in your heart. To be bitter with your brother is guilty, is to be guilty of murder in your heart. Friends, when you allow the seeds of sin to be planted in your heart and then you water them and you nourish them, what do you expect is going to happen? They are going to spring up and they are going to bear fruit and that fruit will be ugly, wicked fruit. This is why we cannot give sin any quarter in our lives as john owen the famous puritan once said you have, he said it's a choice be killing sin or sin will be killing you it's one or the other you're not in neutral it's one or the other sin is crouching at the door it's waiting for you and it's not going away not this side of heaven it's not going away 
Despite this warning, however, it, incredibly, Cain will not be deterred. Of, of Cain's obstinance, Derek Kidner writes this, an interesting observation. He says, Whereas Eve had to be talked into her sin by the serpent, it appears that Cain would not be talked out of his intended sin even by the Lord himself. And here Cain demonstrates the progression of sin and hard-heartedness. He speaks to his brother. We're not told what he says. Some translations add the, let's go out to the field there. That's just, that's intended, but that's not in the actual language. But the assumption is that some have said that he, he, he shared what God had told him with his brother in a mocking way. We don't really know for sure. But the point is this. He goes out with his brother into the field, and in a premeditated, uh, premeditated moment, he rose up against his brother Abel and he killed him. His own brother. They had grown up together in the same home. They had shared meals around the table together. They had played with one another as young boys. And he rises up and he kills his brother. Cain's murder is a direct consequence of his disdain for God. A.W. Pink once wrote, he said, The one who has no fear of God before his eyes has no genuine respect for the rights of his neighbor. That's why love for God and love for neighbor are joined together so tightly throughout the whole Bible. Your love for neighbor is dependent upon your love for God. In fact, remember the Apostle John says, what's the best way to, to determine whether or not you love God? What's the barometer of your love for God? It's easy. It's your love for your brother. If you hate him whom you've seen, don't tell me that you love God whom you haven't seen. Immediately it would seem the Lord comes to Cain after this grievous sin. And he comes with another question. One last question. Where is your brother? Again, like Adam, where are you? Where is your brother? One final opportunity to own up to what you have done, Cain. And Cain's response is dripping with disdain. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my day to keep track of Abel? So not only does he refuse to take responsibility for his sin, but he essentially tells God, I couldn't care less about my brother. Why don't you go find him yourself? And God's concern for justice for the innocent is made clear in verse 10. He says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. The late F.B. Meyer said, the Lord keeps inventory of his saints. I love that. The Lord keeps inventory of his saints. You're never out of his eye. You're never out from under his care, or his attention. The life of Abel was not an insignificant footnote in history. He was precious to God. And when his blood was spilled onto the ground, the very ground itself, we are told, cried out for vindication. And Cain's actions demanded justice. There are many things that the Lord hates, we're told in the book of Proverbs. Hands that shed innocent blood is one of them. And if you read, if you read the, the, the things that the Lord hates, Cain is guilty of all of them. But hands that shed innocent blood, it shows it's, it's the, to, to slay the one who is, who, who is created in the image of God is to show absolute disdain for the one whose image is reflected in that person. Do you understand that murder, abortion, all of these things are, are, are an attempt to kill God, as it were. It, we can't get Him. We can't get our arms around, our hands around the throat of God, but we can get our arms and hands around the throat of His image bearers. And so we will. In response to blood, the blood crying out from the ground, we see that God curses Cain. This is the first person cursed in the Bible. Adam and Eve were not cursed. The creation was cursed on account of them, but they themselves were not cursed. But this time, Cain himself is cursed. Look at verse 11. 
and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Remember, the ground became difficult to till. The crops could still be brought from it. A man would have to work hard, but he could, he could make a living from the ground. He could feed himself and his family from the, the fruit of the ground. But now, and it seems that Cain had had some success in doing this, but now that was going to be taken from him. Now the ground would no longer cooperate with him. The ground which received his brother's blood would no longer produce for him. It's as, though, it's as though Cain had forced his brother's blood upon the ground, and so now the ground would reject Cain. No longer would the, the, the ground produce a harvest for him. And because of this, obviously, he was now going to be forced to wander as a fugitive. He couldn't set up a farm and work the t- soil. He would be forced to wander, to look for food, to try to find his way. And in response to this punishment, Cain demonstrates sorrow. He demonstrates sorrow. My punishment is more than I can bear. But this is not sorrow for what he has done, but rather it is sorrow for what his sin has cost him. He is more concerned with his punishment than with the sin that led to it. This is not fair. It's too hard for me. I can't farm. What will I do? And to top it all off, I will be killed by those who seek to avenge my brother. Now remember... Everyone who lived at that time was related to Abel and Cain. So this was not just some disconnected thing. This was family. Now, we're not going to get into this. We know that Cain finds a wife. People ask that question. But, but remember, people are living long lives. We don't know how long Cain and Abel had lived at this point, but they could be quite old. And, and if they lived to be quite old, and when, when this all took place, uh, and they had children, and then children's children, it doesn't say that Cain uh, necessarily found a wife, but him and his wife conceived. But the whole point is is this. There could have been thousands, hundreds of thousands of people living on the earth at this time. And of course, they all would have been related to one another. Uh, People say, what about birth defects? And Remember, Adam and Eve had perfect genetic code, right? They they were not born with with genetic defects. So why would people live to be so old in this time? It's quite possible because genetic defects, which are a consequence of sin, had not spread through the human race to the degree to which they have now after many, many years of procreation. But that's another story altogether. I don't want to get into that. You can read up on that as, as you see fit and study books have been written on it and so on. But Cain here is, is angry and, and, and he realizes that, look, when people find out what I have done, they will kill me. They will kill me. But even in this moment, God shows Cain mercy. So that Cain's life would be preserved, God, we're told, put a mark on him. We're not told what the mark is. It's not even, don't even try to speculate because it's not explained in any way, shape, or form. So we don't know what the mark is. But there was some kind of identifying mark placed upon Cain that told other people that, look, if you lay a hand on him, then judgment will fall on you sevenfold. So even in this sin, even in the face of Cain's lack of repentance, God protects him. That's incredible mercy. As we sang this morning, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would not have given him this mercy, right? I mean, especially if I'm family. I, I would not have shown that level of mercy to Cain. But God does. Friends, let me encourage you, because this is important to remember. Do not make the mistake of thinking that just because God has not brought immediate consequences for your sin, that somehow you're all good with him. That somehow, remember in Romans chapter 3, some people thought that, that God was weak because in his forbearance he passed over former sins. And people were wondering, well, why isn't God doing anything about these sins? And then in chapter 2, you remember, he says, and Paul warns the Romans, he says, do not presume upon God's kindness. Because his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Friends, every, we all stand under the, the sentence of death. And the only reason that we are given a breath this morning to, to breathe in and breathe out this moment is because God's kindness is bearing with you so that you might repent. Because once that last breath is taken, 
the opportunity for repentance, the opportunity for salvation is gone. It is gone. And God here is bearing with Cain, showing him mercy. He's not being a neglectful judge, nor is he excusing Cain's sin. He is bearing with Cain that Cain might in time repent. Sadly, of course, there is no evidence that Cain repented. Cain is mentioned several times in the Bible, in the New Testament, as is Abel. And it does not appear in any way, shape, or form that Cain Cain ever repented. He's always painted in a negative light. Jude speaks of the way of Cain as as being something evil and wicked, something that that the people of God should should, uh, not pursue or not follow. So Cain never repents. And, and so the seeds of rebellion that he sowed eventually, of course, brought a harvest of evil. We see that there in verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. But notice verse 16, because this is telling. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. He went away from the presence of the Lord. He walked away. And what did he do? We read that he conceived and bore a son. He propagated. Rather than wandering as a fugitive, as God had said, we are told that he attempted to settle down and build a city in the land of Nod. Ironically, the land of Nod means wanderings, the land of wanderings. And he builds a city there. And he names that city after his son, Enoch. And, and, and the, the, it's, it would seem here that that the, the attempt to name the, build a city and name it after his son was kind of almost like foreshadowing Babel to make a name for himself apart from God. And then after Enoch, we read of the family line of Cain. We have Enoch, Erod, Mahujael, Methusael, and then Lamech. Lamech demonstrates that the wickedness of Cain had been passed down to his descendants and parents. Listen to me. Our kids are picking up what we're, what we're putting out there. Your priorities, your decisions, your example, you're passing that on. In fact, I would say the greatest thing you will get, you will give your children, in, in terms great, and what I mean by greatest is, is as far as just the sheer weight and volume of influence, will, will not be through the inheritance you live them, you gave them when you died. It will be what you gave them while you lived. You show up for church two Sundays a month, guess what? My guess would be your children won't show up at all. Maybe once a month. I mean, we could go down the list. We are passing something on. And and, and you see this. This is what is passed on from from Cain the murderer. and, And you see this propagation, not just of humanity, but propagation of evil from one generation to the next generation until you come to a man named Lamech. And and he demonstrates on full scale what the wickedness of man looks like. Lamech, we are told here, notice says he married two wives, Ada and Zillah. I've heard people say, well, polygamy is in the Bible. If you're going to talk about biblical marriage, well, what about polygamy? Look, polygamy was never put into scriptures as something to be, uh, to be upheld as the norm. He took two wives in rebellion against God's order in Genesis chapter 2, that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Not the three, not the four, but the two shall become one flesh. Marriage was a re- this, this marriage of, of Lamech and these two wives was a rejection of God's order for marriage. But it is interesting also that Lamech fathered children. And these children are known for their cultural contributions. It, it would seem that they were quite adept at craftsmanship, at the arts. Some were musicians playing instruments. Others were, were me- makers of metal. They made uh, all sorts of implements out of bronze and iron. And of course, with Lamech, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. Verse 23. He breaks out in song. He sings a song of celebration to his wives. Adon, Zila, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me. 
a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Lamech, like his grandfather, has killed a man. He has killed a man. It would seem that though the man was not, had not done anything that was requiring the death penalty, but yet he kills him. It's, it's very clear this is murder. And he says here that he, it says here that he wears this murder as a badge of honor. As a badge of honor. That which Cain had kind of, at least Cain seemed somewhat apathetic about the murder of his brother. And sorrowful over its consequences. Lamech just flat out celebrates murder. He glories in it. If Cain was to to be avenged sevenfold for the murder of his brother, Lamech says, hey, what I've done deserves to be avenged 77-fold. I upped my grandfather in a big way. In other words, Cain may have been a bad guy, but I'm far worse, so you better steer clear of me. What a harvest of wickedness was sown by Cain. His descendants redefined God-ordained institutions meant for human flourishing like marriage. They cheapened life, disregarded life. They sought to create an existence for themselves apart from God, creating cities and culture, not for God's glory, but for self-indulgence and as a testament to themselves. I don't know about you, but that sounds like 2022 to me. Nothing new under the sun, is there? It is a picture of an affluent, self-indulgent society living in utter defiance of God. And in Cain's line, we find the seeds of the sin that will ultimately lead to the judgment of the flood. But in spite of this, we still find hope. A cause for hope. Look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born, uh, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So Eve gives birth to another son, Seth, who in turn bears a son, Enosh. And we are told that it was through this new line, that that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And what makes Seth's line a cause for hope was not merely that they were just good people, but rather that their hearts had turned to the Lord. They they trusted the Lord. They, They chose to obey the Lord. While the godless line of Cain would lead ultimately to judgment, it is through the godly line of Seth that deliverance and salvation will come. And we will see this salvation typified in Seth's 10th great-grandson, a man by the name of Noah. But it is in Abel, friends, that we see a glimpse of the hope of salvation, the true hope of salvation. If you look closely at Cain, you see the flickers of this hope. You see, in the shedding of Abel's innocent blood, we find foreshadowed the blood of another innocent whose death would bring life and salvation to all who would call upon his name. Like Abel, he would be obedient and faithful, pleasing to God, but he too would be killed by those who despised God, by those who despise obedience. But in his offering, many would be saved. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, the blood of Abel spoke. It's described as speaking. In the text, it cried out from the ground. What did, what did the blood of Abel speak for? It cried out for justice. It cried out for vengeance upon his killer. God, make this right. Avenge me. No mercy. 
Crush him. Destroy him. No quarter for the sinner. But what does the blood of Jesus Christ say? The blood of Jesus Christ says this. Come. Come to the table. You are forgiven. Because of what I have done on the cross. The blood of Jesus, you see, friends, speaks, but it speaks a better word than the blood of Abel because it opened up the way for sinners to be forgiven. It opened up the way for sinners to escape justice, for sinners to escape judgment, to have life and to be reconciled to God and to be reconciled to one another. The seed of the woman overcomes. And the clash of the seed of the woman that we see begin here between Cain and Abel reaches its ultimate culmination at the cross where the blood of Jesus Christ is shed for sinners. You see, friends, if you will come to God in faith, you see, just like the blood of Abel, the blood of all the innocents, as it were, all of the injustice of this world cries out to God for vengeance. Every evil word you have spoken, every evil deed you have done cries out to God for vengeance. Don't think that just because you haven't spilled blood on the ground that, that you are any less culpable for sin. You are. We are. I am. We all are. For the wages of sin is death. All of us will die. The soul that sins shall die. We all have the, the, the weight of the wrath of God hanging over us, as it were, as the sword of Damocles, waiting to drop upon us at the moment of our death. But God in his goodness and in his grace has sent Jesus to come. And Jesus came and he, he stood between us and the wrath of God. He took the judgment. He bore that penalty, that judgment that was due you and I. The sword that should have fallen on us fell upon him. Three days later, he rose again from that grave, proving that the sins for which he died were not his sins. And the Bible makes this promise that if you will come today in faith and you will trust in what God has done through Jesus Christ for your forgiveness, that Jesus, that Jesus lived a perfect life, the life that you and I were called and commanded to live by God but could not live and would not live, if, if you will trust that Jesus Christ lived that perfect life, and that he died in your place. The death that you deserve, that I deserve, the judgment that you deserved and I deserve. That, that, that God sent Jesus and Jesus took that punishment on himself. He bore it. He absorbed it in his body on the cross. And three days later rose again. The Bible says that if you will come in faith trusting in that reality, that work, that here's what God will do. He will take that perfect life that Jesus lived and he will give it to you. And he will look at you as though you lived the life that Jesus lived. And he will see you through the, through, through the eyes of a father who's looking on his perfect son. And he will count your sins paid for, gone, thrown away as far as the east is from the, the west into the deepest sea. They're all gone. Past, present, future. It's over. It's done. You're forgiven. You're freed. And you will be given new life, eternal life. So that on that day when you die, it will not be the end for you. You will one day be resurrected to righteousness and to hope and to eternity in heaven with him. Friends, that is the hope of the gospel. That is the hope of the gospel. You see, friends, all of you in this room today belong to one of the two seeds. You, you are either in the seed of the woman or you are in the seed of the serpent Satan. And the determining factor upon that is what you do with the invitation that God gives you come whose vision of life are you living your own or god's do you say your will be done or my will be done do you grasp for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil do you insist on defining what is right and wrong for yourself if so you are in the seed of the serpent the seed of satan and you will face the same punishment that he will face. His head will be crushed, and all those who are in him will be crushed as well. But if you are of the seed of the woman, 
If you are in the seed of the woman, in Jesus Christ, you will be forgiven. Forgiven. There's nothing that you have done, could do, or will ever do that is outside the bounds of God's grace. Friends, if he is willing to bear with and protect and care for a, a sinner, an evil, wicked murderer like Cain, I think that tells me there's hope for all of us. And my prayer this morning is that you would trust him. That you would put your faith in him, in him alone. Let's pray. Father, take your word, I pray this morning. Work in our hearts. Teach us your ways. Not that we might just have information, but Father, that we might walk in them. Father, that we would rid ourselves of the vision that we have for this life. And Father, we would say to you this day, your will be done, not mine. We pray it in Jesus' name.